I'm back. Well, what have we got today? Well, here we are in the Evil Owl Studios. And uh, yeah, we've got one of these SG things. We're going to take a closer look, of course. I wanted to take a look at an SG because in actual fact, an SG was the first real guitar, for want of a better phrase, that I ever bought. But anyway, we're here to look at this today. This, this is an Epiphone. It's not a Gibson, but it's not an ordinary Epiphone, just run-of-the-mill, lying-around type of thing. This thing's a little bit different, and that's why I bought it. Now, the theory is, let's, let's get it this way to you. This is a Gibson, oh, sorry, it's an Epiphone SG. It's an SG Custom, as you can tell from these inserts, and usually by this thing at the top of the neck. This has got the later Epiphone uh, style, but we'll come back to all of that. As you can see, it's gold plated and it all looks great from where you are, but how does it look from where I am? And is this really like a Gibson SG or even an Epiphone SG that's well made? Who knows? And that's why we're here today. Let's go and take a look at this thing really close up. Decide what these pickups are and all the rest of it. I know what they say they are and stuff like that, but it's nicer to get close up and, well, decide whether this thing's for you or whether it isn't. There are some natural problems with SGs, which I'll cover along the road as we go. So let's get down a bit closer uh, so we can see what, well, what we're talking about. In fact, I think I'll probably just zoom in to this initially and then, uh, and then go down later to the closer bits. Let's consider what we've got here. This thing looks like a really good Gibson SG from where I sit, just over here. But is it? I think when we get a bit closer to this guitar, that, well, things change a little bit. And it's in the, usually in the nitty gritty of, of things like, you know, cheaper guitars where we get let down a lot and I didn't really want this one to be in a position where it's not actually standing up to its own reputation if you follow me. Well what have we got? Well we've got this SG shape it's well universal everybody's got it what's well, everybody's got it is that Angus Young guy's got one similar and then there's that other guy that Tony Iommi well he shouldn't be ignored, should he? Tony Iommi, one of them great guitarists. Well, they're all great in their own way. I think the thing is, this isn't their guitars, is it? It's not the guitar that they use, but it's a nice enough replica from a distance. We've got gold pickups, more of them later. We've got a sort of Gibson-esque bridge, which isn't really that Gibson-esque, in my opinion. It's not like the ones that I used to know. And you've got the tailpiece, which again, it looks just like a Gibson tailpiece style. As I said, these are Epiphone. They're not quite what you think they are. This switch, well, to be honest, that does feel a bit cheap. But more on that later. And as for these knobs, again, from where you're sitting right now, these look, well, they look, well, as they should. And so, there we have the guitar input, which is where it usually is. It all looks nice down here. It's got its scratch plate or pit guard there. And it's got a little filler plate just up the top. But when we get in closer, we can look at all that. And taking a quick look at that neck, I mean, you can see the, the general uh, finish of this thing. It's bound, if you notice, because this is a custom, and customs usually are bound. It's got the square inlays, which, again, the customs usually have. And up at the top of the neck, like I showed earlier, we've, uh, we've got the, the sort of Gibson custom logo, although it says Epiphone above it. So you could expect this to be good. And this is, uh, this is not decent wood as well. This is an ebony-based SG with gold fittings and uh, yeah, it all looks absolutely wonderful, at least for now. Let's get this down on the table below and get rid of that owl out the scene. 
<laughs> and then we can have a closer look at, uh, well, where everything is and what we get and what we don't get. Because I think it's quite important. Especially on a guitar at this price. Well, I hope you can see some example of the sort of quality of the finish on this guitar. That, although it's just a black finish, it's uh, really, really well finished off. There's not a blemish on the guitar, in fact it's nigh on perfect. And if you didn't see the headstock, at this particular point you might, you might, I'm saying you would, you might just actually consider all this to come from a Gibson. <laughs> and that's about where it stops really, because as soon as you start looking a bit closer, well then you start seeing these differences. Now they're not the end of the world differences and for your money that you pay for this, which we'll get to afterwards, I think, uh, I think it's a pretty cool uh, deal actually. But I am going to change this guitar from where it is currently. Uh, these pickups are going to be changed. Now, tell me why are you going to change them? What's wrong with the ones that are on it? Well, there's nothing actually wrong as such with the ones that are on it, but I think I've got some better pickups than them that can fit in this guitar, and I don't really care about uh, anything else, really. I'm more interested in its sounds, aren't you? Of course you are. Okay, well, if you look at the switch here, to me, this is, this is a pretty miserable, can you see that? Can you see it moving? It's a pretty miserable switch. And again, to be honest, it probably wants swapping out for a decent switch. Yeah, that to me, and it's, uh, what we call this, and it's labeling on this piece of plastic. The piece of plastic really isn't very good. It looks amateurish and cheap to me, as far as that uh, plastic cover goes, and the switch itself. I, I mean, I, I really don't like seeing switches like that. I think that's, that's poor. Moving along a bit further, looking at these, well, on the surface, where you are currently, these look quite good. You know, they feel good. There's not a lot of play in them. And they look good as well. Well, they do, as I said, from where you are. But take a look at the picture on the screen right now, and you can see that there's this unholy gap here, underneath. Well, that's how much gap's underneath it. You can see that. It's quite a substantial gap. And it's one that exists because when they fitted the CTS pots that they are, and again you can see them on the screen right now, those are real CTS pots, so they, they put decent, decent enough pots in, although some people will argue that, oh yeah, well, I remember Sir arguing with me, yeah, John Sir arguing about C CTS pots are crap, I think that's how the conversation went, something like that. And, uh, you know, we use Alps. And I thought, well, Alps sounded, you know, they're a little bit cheaper than the CTS ones, aren't they? But that was another story. But I, I've always liked CTS pots, irrespective of what someone else might say, you know. Uh, so to me, I'm, I'm happy to see CTS pots in here. I'm less happy because they didn't adjust the pots properly when they fitted them. And that's why you have this unholy gap underneath all of these underneath all of these, you see that? Well, you can see it, it just fits. I mean, that's got to be a good six mil or quarter of an inch, give or take. So that to me, well, shouldn't be like that. It's easy enough to fix if you are into fixing guitars, but if you're not, well, that's how it comes from the factory. By the way, this guitar was purchased from Sound Effects in Ormskirk in the UK. Uh, somewhere near Manchester or Liverpool Way, that sort of area. And he did a fair job of setting the guitar up as it should be. In fact, this one's got quite a nice uh, action on it. But we'll get to that in a bit. But, of course, no dealer's going to say, oh, these pots are too high. or they... <laughs> They're not going to do that on a, on a sort of budget guitar. I mean, they could be there forever, I wouldn't they? So, 
let's not uh, hold it against uh, that company because I'm pretty confident that every company out there would have done the same. They would have made sure the important bits matter. But having uh, pots that stick out further than they should isn't really part of the remit, in my opinion. We also got the guitar output that goes off to your amp and well that's what you'd expect it to be and that's what it is i can't really say more about that at this stage but let's move a little bit closer if i can get closer and have a look at a few of the other things now then for all intents and purposes i mean we could all say that well oh, it's a gibson sg look at the stock tailpiece and all the rest of it but it's not quite this is fair enough I think, uh, yeah, that'll suffice. I'm happy with that. Although it's obviously not a Gibson one, it's a cheaper equivalent. But I'm happy enough with that. However, it's when you come to the bridge. Yeah, this bridge, looking down at these side adjusters. Yeah, there's one there. You can see that side. These side adjusters give me room for concern. And they aren't quite as I'd expect them. Uh, but that is what they are, that's how they come. You've got what you've got, you're not gonna go and change it in two minutes, probably. And one of the giveaways with this bridge, like uh, you'll see on the, even on the newer Gibsons, I believe, some people tell me, it's got a slot in the top of these two, so you can adjust them with an ordinary flathead screwdriver. Well, the old guitars never used to come like that from the likes of Gibson. No, you'd never see slots like that. And on this guitar, you never see adjusters on a, a, a real Gibson SG. At least the ones I know of, the older ones, uh, like this. But it suffices, it, it does its job. There's no real play in this thing. It's all hammered down pretty tight. You could adjust it like with these things, but you could adjust it with the, yeah, the screwdriver but it is what it is the fact is anyway that the dealer did set all this up and I'm happy enough with all of that that's no problem but it's an average type of bridge that you'd expect to find on a copy style of guitar just taking a look at the few of the pictures that uh, that I've taken you can see on this bridge that you've got three of the saddles facing back and three of the saddles facing forward, which isn't that unusual. And strangely enough, on my Jimmy Page West Paul, some of them were like that, which is a, a, a genuine uh, Gibson Jimmy Page West Paul. So, so yeah, uh, none of that really matters. They've got the screw heads coming in from the front. So if you want to make any adjustments to this, you're doing them from the front for the saddles. Which is a little bit, well, it's a bit awkward too, but that's life, that's the way it's set up. They do say that this bridge is a lock tone bridge. It's an ABR tunematic lock tone bridge. That's the term they use. And they use a trademark on that, so somebody's trademarked that name, lock tone. Not that it makes much difference. It is what it is, isn't it? Anyway, onto these two uh, pickups. These are Alnico Custom Pro humbuckers. Now, what does that really mean? Does it mean that they're Gibson pickups? Does it mean that they're not? Does it mean that they're made by Epiphone and they're similar to the Gibson pickups? Who knows? Well, there's so many questions there. We're going to take these off in a little while and have a look at what them are. Uh, just for the, the hell of it, man. <laughs> so enough for them for now. Let's move on up the guitar. You can see straight off that it's bound around the neck. And these frets are they sort of, well, medium jumbo. That's how I describe them. They remind me of the old, to be honest, of the old uh, Gibson SG style that I had back in 1971, I think it was. Might have been 72, but that was on an SG uh, special at the time. Yeah, more than that later. So you can see that they bound, but if you look carefully, they're not covered over on the ends with the little nibs and certainly not covered over on the ends uh, on this Epiphone, that's for sure. But the old customs used to be like that and uh, that's a, an immediate giveaway, I guess. Unless you go and get a brand new custom and it hasn't got the nibs, but 
I do know Gibson was flipping around with them for a while. Yeah, what more can I say about that? Yeah, as well as as well as the frets and the rest of it, you've got these inserts, and these inserts do look particularly well done. There's no filling that I can see. I'm looking really close here, closer than you, and uh, I don't see any filling of any kind on them. They're, it's an absolutely excellent job. Oh, just before we do move further down the neck, I don't think these uh, these frets are stainless steel or anything like that. I think they're average run of the mill fret material. <laughs> Well, here I am down at the other end of the neck uh, to where the nut is. And interestingly, although it doesn't look a brilliant nut, uh, in fact, it probably is because it's, uh, it's basically, it's a graft tech nut. So, well, it might not look perfect. I'll show you a few pictures as we go. Uh, in fact, is it is perfect. <laughs> so what can you say about that? Well, not a lot. But do take a look at these inserts again as we've moved down and you can see that the the quality of the inserts is well to be honest it's exceptional uh you don't see many uh well guitars like copying an sg that have custom inserts as good as that there's not that many around and that goes the same for the next bit when we move up a little bit yeah anyway let's move on because there's not much else to say about that right now we'll be back and once again we've got a bound headstock you can see that it's all very nice in fact uh, it's as good a job as I think you could probably find on anything really very well uh, finished off You've got the usual sort of bell cover here that's looking after the truss rod. And you've even got gold screws on that, which is, well, it's interesting. There they are. And uh, slightly different than some of the Gibsons, although it is an Epiphone, but it's supposed to be emulating a Gibson. So, you know, it's all par for the course, isn't it? Well, look at this insert here. Uh, and this insert here is nigh on. It absolutely is nigh on perfect. It's not good, it's perfect. In fact, if I saw that actually on a real Gibson, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, I think it's really, really well done. So is the Epiphone logo. But it is what it is. You either like it or you don't. It's also got the sort of book type of headstock, which the Epiphone switched to a while back. Uh, and I, I think this one's better. But to be honest, I think all this faffing around with Epiphone headstocks and the rest of it, why don't you just put a Gibson <laughs> headstock on the thing? <laughs> He's still not a Gibson, is he? <laughs> if you get me, I don't know. I, some people would say, oh, you can't do that. And other people would say, well, why not? Like me. Yeah. Okay, well, here we are around the back, and it all looks good on the face of it. Well, I wouldn't call it perfect by anybody's standard, but it's okay. It's, you know, a, a, a cheaper model of an SG. What do you want? Well, let's start as we mean to proceed. It's actually got the serial number stamped into the headstock, just like a Gibson SG would have. It's also got the usual stuff stuck on the back. Well, most of it. This one's a, a Wii. Uh, signature or mark that says don't throw it in the bin and that sort of thing. It tells you where it's made too, handcrafted in China if you like that sort of thing. Me personally, well some of it's better than others. Some's good, some's less good. And we've also got a inspection card here, QC, two red things and a squiggle at the bottom that says it's been QC'd. Well, yeah, I haven't really found uh, anything particularly wrong with this up to yet. Looking at these uh, tuners, they are very reminiscent of the Gibson ones. And these ones are called Deluxe Machine Heads, Epiphone Deluxe Machine Heads. And sure enough, it does say Deluxe on them. They all sort of look, well, they look like the Gibson ones you might find on... Uh, you know, a, a sort of gold-plated Les Paul or something like that. That's what they look like. They've got the plastic on the end, which is what it is. And <laughs> I'm afraid at best that is what it is, and that's probably what it will stay. Plastic. Unless you want to get some Gibson ones and fit them, because that's what I did on a, a Les Paul 
that I had uh, from Chokai. So I fitted a set of Gibson tuners on because they were better than the Tokai ones. And I suspect they'd be better than these Epiphone ones too. Now around here there's no uh, volute or anything like that. It's a surprisingly thin neck. And you can just about feel there. You, you won't see it. I couldn't easily show it you. But you can just about feel. Uh, that feels to me like it's originated from a scarf joint. If you know what a scarf joint is. I'd be pretty sure that it's joined just by my finger. Now I do have a picture of that uh, that's probably on the screen right now. But the chances of you actually seeing it are exceedingly remote. Uh, if you look just where my finger is, right in front of it, there's actually a tiny little ramp that uh, gives away, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but it sort of gives away that that's been stuck on the top with a scarf joint. Now taking a look down this neck, it's an incredibly slim neck, very thin this way. Um, it's not a massively wide thin neck, so think of it like a Gibson neck. Well, if you can think of the Gibson neck, anybody who's used one. But it's thinner than a, a regular Gibson style neck. It's what I'd expect to be on a Gibson SG, even though it's an Epiphone. It really is what I'd expect, and it reminds me so much of that uh, SG special I had back in 1971. It was a very thin neck like that. And of course, so long, uh, which is the, the thing about these types of guitars and necks. But they bring in some other problem, which we'll come back to a bit later. And by the way, at the nut side of things, uh, the size is 1.693 inches. I don't have it in metric, but you could work it out. And also it's scale length, which most people might know, anybody who's familiar with this sort of Gibson sort of stuff. It's 24.75 inches scale length, yeah, which is par for the course with this design. Well, just taking a look at this neck on the neck joint. It doesn't remind me of exactly how I remember my SG, but it's, I guess it's surprisingly similar. This uh, thing here, it's a bit of a pain in the neck. We'll come back to that. Well, it's not quite in the neck, but it, <laughs> you get me. But uh, the joint itself, yeah, this joint doesn't look exactly the same as uh, the SG as I remember it, but it's very similar. But this here, well, that's another story, and one we'll come back to a little bit later when we go back up top. You ought to be looking at that carefully. Yeah, the rest of this body, by the way, it's absolutely perfect and pristine. It's flatted down like you wouldn't believe. It's really that good. Now, I'm not going to actually bore you too much with this particular, uh, <laughs> this particular cover. Uh, it, it, whether it's exactly the same shape as an SG, well, I can't even remember. I don't remember mine being exactly that shape. But it's mounted with four gold screws in this case. And it's a real good fit. So whoever's done that, once again, it's a real McCoy job. Now taking a look inside there, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the pots are CST pots, just like they said. But the second important thing is that if you look at the cabling, the pickups are actually connected with a connector, which makes things easier if you want to take some out. Now the thing about that is, if you haven't got any connectors that are the same, you might have a bit of a problem, uh, you know, in actually changing those connectors. But that's par for the course, I guess. And there are ways around it, such as cutting the wires. <laughs> but that's up to you. Uh, what I would say is that you might like the pickups that are in it, you might not. And the thing is with pickups, they're very subjective. So, you know, if you want to spend as much on the pickups as you did on the guitar, well, that's quite possible to do these days, believe it or not. Oh, there's one last thing around there in that uh, that hole, and that is that switch. You can see it there, and I'd be wary of that switch. It wants swapping out, if nothing else. But it's uh, it's got a very short body, a narrow body. Uh, it's probably standard SG thickness, but but it's not as wide as uh, say a Les Paul, where they have a particularly deep switch 
that fits into the cavity on a Les Paul. Uh, this is a narrower switch, so I do believe they do make Switchcraft make a, a narrow one that you could fit in an SG. And if you can get it, get this crappy thing out and put a decent one in. If you just uh, sort of learn a player or something, it won't make any difference to you, but later on it might. The very last thing is you've got a standard sort of uh, thing here that you can put your strap on and it's good enough so it ain't going to fall off. I don't think how you cut this SG that it really matters. It's, uh, it's a pretty reasonable product for the price. One thing, remember it doesn't come with a case does this guitar. Yeah, the SG Custom, which this one is, has no case by default. It's got an optional case, but, well, what they should have done is put the price up by 70 quid or something and thrown in the case. It would have made sense, to be honest. It's supposed to be a custom, so it's supposed to be slightly a bit more at market than some of the others, the standard SGs that Epiphone make, but, well, apparently it isn't. <laughs> but it is, if you get me. Oh, by the way, another thing on this, something I never mentioned, is the standard strings on this are 10 to 46s. Yeah, well, mine, oh, mine are a bit lighter than that now. Mine are like 8s to 38s. Yeah. Now, like I said earlier, I got this one from uh, Sound Effects, uh, Ormskirk in the UK. If you've never heard of them, but they do sell loads and loads of guitars and pedals and Stuff like that, they're not a bad dealer, a PRS dealer as well, and they do sell all of the PRS stuff. And that uh, A60E that I reviewed not very long ago, that'll probably be down in the text somewhere with a link, uh, that also came from, uh, from that company, because that's where the PRS guy said, oh, I'll get you one cent to there. So that's where it came from. I've dealt with that particular company off and on, quite a lot uh, over a few years and I bought some proper PRS's from them that sort of thing and I rented pedals and all of the good stuff you know and they never let me down really so uh, that's why I mention them and any company that I sort of buy from and they're good I always try and say it yeah they're good so they're no exception and uh, yeah my thanks to the man that mattered <laughs> is Tim and uh, yeah he got this out for me with his colleagues for the next day. Now the next question is, uh, well how much are these darn things? Well you see them varying in price quite a lot. Uh, from about £550 in the UK, all the way down to about 460 or 465 I paid 499 but I think that was a fair enough price. And I like dealers to make a little bit of money. <laughs> you don't want to make it nothing, otherwise, uh, well, it might be shipped to you, not checked, like I've seen not very long ago. So, yeah, for me, 499 I was happy with, and I wanted to get it the next day. So that's the, the sort of price you can expect to pay. The action on this one, by the way, is exceedingly good. I'm not gonna go zooming in there. All I can tell you, on that action there, it's probably as good as any that I've got. It's uh, really low and it's like butter. But I, I personally would prefer different pickups. I've already been playing this uh, just so I can get a, a good feel of it. I might well uh, record something with these pickups on and then do a switch and so on and so forth. Uh, now on to those pickups. Let's just discuss them. Well, here's one of them pulled out, and as you can see in the back, that is what they are. They're nothing, in my opinion, particularly special. They don't feel right to me. They don't have enough drive for my liking. They might have enough drive for you, and if you're learning guitar or something, uh, well, they've probably got more drive than you need. But for me, no, they're not what I want, so those particular pickups, nothing wrong with them, really. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. I mean, they are what they are. They're built for a price, no matter what Epiphone or Gibson or anybody else might tell you. And uh, I doubt you'll see them exact pickups on any Gibson anytime soon. That's worth uh, bearing in mind. And uh, don't always listen to all the... Oh. Don't always listen to all the bull. 
that's kicking around out there. Yeah. Oh, what's the warranty? Well, once again, the warranty sort of fluctuated up and down a little bit where I came from. From some dealers, it was three years. From others, it seemed to be one year. And others didn't talk about warranty. So <laughs> just check your warranty when you uh, go and buy one of these with where you're buying it from. That's what I would say, because if you just, if I was to say to you now, oh, it's got one year, your dealer might offer you three years or somebody else might offer you five years. Well, who knows? <laughs> the warranty, strangely enough, in the paperwork it comes with, it just says it includes an extensive warranty, but it doesn't actually tell you how long that warranty is, which is a bit of a sort of shortcoming. As is, another little point on this uh, guitar, my, it won't make any difference to its playing and that sort of thing, but I, I'd like to see these things. There's no CE marking on this guitar whatsoever, from what I can see. Now, while that doesn't affect most people, it might affect the person that's selling it or the importer because they're supposed to have CE marks on them when they come into the UK, or the new UK CE marking, or C whatever it was. Yeah, showed you in the last video. So that might be something to consider. The warranties, what it is, check with where you're buying it from because your original warranty is always going to be with the seller, at least in the UK and probably the same in the USA. Tony, <laughs> where are we at with this guitar? Would you buy another one? Well, I would buy another one, but I'd still do to the another one what I'm going to do to this one. And some people say, oh, you're not going to do that, are you? And I'm going to say, yes, I am. Well, you we already know about the pickups being flipped out, or will be. And I'll be realigning these knobs to where they should be. And I'll be changing that switch to what it should be. I've already worked on the strings and the rest. I might even find, well, no, I'll leave that for now. That'll do as it is. However, there's one thing that's... Uh, not so good with an SG, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. You might be, or you might not. Yeah, you're not going to believe me, but with a guitar like this, especially if you've never played one, with a guitar like this, because it's got a smaller body than some of the others, the Les Paul always springs to mind, or even a Les Paul copy, because it's got a smaller body, it's still a mahogany body, by the way, but it's smaller, so it's lighter. And this is a big, long neck that goes up to, I think, 22 frets on this one. Yeah, I would say it's 22 frets. So what happens is you end up with this neck weighing quite heavily. And you can see, well, you saw earlier, let's put it that way, that the headstock was bigger than the last pour as well. Not by much, but it all matters. It's all still mahogany, so it claims. And the point of it is that what you end up with is a neck heavy guitar. And where do they fit the, uh, the strap button? Oh, go on. They fit it on the back here, just level with the neck. Yeah, yeah. What's that gonna do? When you're playing this guitar, it's gonna drop down like you wouldn't believe. Some of them are worse than others. However, who's been watching Tony Iommi? Anybody? Of course you have. You haven't? Where have you been? Well, go and watch him. Go and watch him in them concerts and the rest of it, and you'll see his SG. Now, his SG is a left-handed job, but that doesn't make any difference. It's still full down neck heavy, just like on well, that one. Yeah, so there's no answer there. But what you'll find with Tony Iommi, you believe this or not, he took the strap button and he moved it from down the back of the neck here and he moved it right to there. Yeah, just at the edge of that there. And the point about moving it to the edge of that there is it stops the guitar from being neck heavy. I haven't seen many people do that, but you could actually cut a little piece out, which I probably will do and have me a little bit of black paint. I don't really care. The likes of Epiphone could have done something about that. What they never did, oh, it wants to be the same as the old one that's got all the problem with the neck heavyweight. And I, I don't quite get any of that. It would have been so easy to put that, uh, that strap button 
just up there. In any case, if I do it, I might make a video on me doing that. And you can all laugh when I get it wrong. <laughs> or not. But I just wanted to raise this point about Gibson SGs, or almost every uh, SG style guitar I've ever played, always is neck heavy. And I, I did send one back, which was a real Gibson. You know, the figured top one. Uh, from about 2000 and... 16, 17, yeah, and that was a couple of thousand pound job, so, but back it went, yeah, I couldn't live with it. Okay, well, here we go, the Tony score, how would I score this out of 10? It's a very important question, you know, some guys, at the sort of price this is, that's a lot of money to them, and I, I'm always trying to, to give you the best uh, sort of justification for what you're paying, compared to the cheaper Epiphone SGs is a good example uh, whether you should spend this extra money. Well, if the gold's not important to you and these inserts aren't important to you, to be absolutely honest, I don't think you should be uh, particularly getting yourself up at £500 or $700, give or take, maybe. Uh, yeah, when you can buy an Epiphone SG for about £350. No, it's got its nice attributes and all the rest of it, but that's the point I'd make to you, is that if you don't want how it looks, then don't buy it. But for me, uh, yeah, I, I like how it looks, and I'm going to be changing things. Unfortunately, I'm, I am. I, I didn't want to, but I'm going to, because I don't care. So, <laughs> so its score out of 10 for me is about, uh, I'd give it about a 7 out of 10. And the reasons for that are, for me, the pickups. Uh, I don't like this switch. I don't like the way these are well off the body. That could all have been fixed or could all have been uh, ad addressed easily. Uh, and it never was. So uh, that's the score. About a 7 out of 10. Well, that's it for now on this one. And um, I wanted to just show you what I'd bought and what came in and how it was and you know coming in from the dealer it's it's fine there's no problem there but I think the point is that you know for its 500 pounds when it uses the word custom on it it's not just custom that you expect it's actually the custom quality that you expect and some of these things down here don't don't wait up for as to being what they should be I don't like the drop down of the neck but that's on every SG so I can't do much about that and that, I haven't counted that within the score because I knew it would do that before I bought it but did you some people don't so that's it for now until next time don't forget to have a look at www.tonymackenzie.com lots of reviews on there if I ever get to put any more on who knows uh, I'm not the time I used to have at the, the moment really because uh, with work commitments of the rest of it. So, uh, you know, they're tough times out there for some people. I happen to be one of the ones where it's tough times for. So, yeah, I have to focus on what pays the money. And you don't. <laughs> okay, well, don't forget to subscribe as well. It costs time, money, effort, all the rest of it in even making a video. And mine isn't your regular sales video like all the rest do, mine's a real video and a real review and that's what I thought of this guitar today and I hope that's helpful to a lot of people. They do look great, they're not always as quite as great as you might think they are but it's not a bad guitar either so don't write it off as being bad. As you'll see when I get to the plane, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good rock guitar. You could use it for a lot of different things. That's it. Until next time, plane's coming up anytime soon. Now get out of here.
Okay, well, these are a couple of Seymour Duncan pickups. As you can see, there's one and here's the other. They came out of a, a guitar that I'd fitted them into a while back, but uh, hardly had any use. And they're the short-legged pickups as well. It says this one's an SH4, a 1171W. Yeah, 2015 that was made, mm, strangely enough. But it is an American pickup. And this other one, oh, let's have a quick look at that. This one here is an SH2N for neck. So that's the neck. This one's the bridge. And they all work fine as a pair. I'm quite sure of that because that's how they were bought. Both American pickups. Both. Very nice in fact. So They're going to fit really well. There won't be any uh, gold covers on them. But I'm not too worried about that. I shall have gold pickup surrounds with a bit of lock. We shall see or not. Thank you. 